Otorgamos para acá, para este lado, para el amarillo. Palguarda, palguarda. Nomás le aviso para que esté pilas. Es un 18 negro, nomás para que esté pilas. Lo que hizo. Galleto, ya me... Carguito, galleto. Chao, 6, 4, gracias, gracias. Cuídense, ahí estamos. There's a connection between violence in Mexico and dirty money flowing through the international financial system. And what that meant is that the drug cartels were able to continue their reign of terror. If we don't take seriously money laundering enforcement, anti-money laundering enforcement, we are, let's, let's not, let's not uh, minimize this, we are aiding and abetting narco-trafficking, terrorism and, and tyranny. No one will hesitate to commit that crime if they think the worst that can happen to them is that they'll pay a fine that will be less than the money they'll be making. Michoacan, a lawless state. Drug lords are sucking the lifeblood out of the local economy. This takeover of the world's leading producer of avocados is destabilizing the market. The price of this green gold has gone up by 22%. We are suffering a great deal from crime, especially from the cartels. The current one is called Los Templarios, or the Templars. They're enforcing commissions, percentages, and production taxes. They decide if you can go to your estate or not, if you can sell at the price that's been set, if you're not allowed to harvest today, but you are tomorrow. They're interfering a great deal in our business. The control over the state means paying the institutions so they participate actively as members of the criminal gangs. In other words, the police are working for the criminals and are participating in smuggling, they're participating in murdering members of rival organizations, and they're participating in civilian kidnappings. When prices are low, the Templarios cartel stops the harvest. Nobody's allowed to harvest in order to make the price of avocados go up. That can last 10 or 20 days. Once we spend a month unable to make any sales, either domestic or export. Eighty percent of the state is run like this. This is how we operate. So it affects both business owners and employees. For example, before, I might have 50 or 100 employees, and now only 10. It affects us as much in terms of extortion as it does in terms of threats. To prevent them knowing if I'm doing well, I have to employ fewer staff. Otherwise, I'd have to pay more. So now they know I don't have a lot of staff. At the farming authority, they can get as much information about you as they need. What you produce on your estate, how many people you employ, how much your estate produces, who the owner is, where is your estate located, how much you harvest for the domestic market, and how much for export. So they go there and check the books, and they can think, this guy gets all that, let's go and tax him. If you have a big operation, they come around and tell you, you need to help us, we need two or three million pesos. And if the farmer refuses, they kill him as a warning. So that's where they get all the information. And if you don't give it to them, they kill the manager, the director, the engineer, everyone. We estimate that the cost of this insecurity to protect the businesses and the people to be around 0.7% of GDP. This then is an extra cost for businesses and people, which has a great impact on the competitiveness of the Mexican economy. It's very harmful in terms of business, because foreign investors no longer want to come here because of the crime that's gripping the state. 
There were some foreign investors, mainly Americans. But now, with the organized crime, they don't want to come here anymore. The traffickers are becoming farmers. Between 20 to 30 percent of all estates have now been taken over by the cartels. The local banks are complicit in these expropriations. Something new is happening. The Templarios cartel has just taken over one of the seven packing factories. Now these green narcos are selling directly to export. There's no doubt that the American importers know what's going on. But since the managers of the businesses are Mexican, they write their reports, and the Americans say, keep working as usual. If you have to pay them off, pay them off. But it's nothing to do with us. Farming's my life. My father was a farmer, and we've been here forever. Where would we go? Here in Mexico, it's the same everywhere. Going abroad would be very difficult. I can't leave because I'm waiting for my two kidnapped sons to be returned. I can't leave. But once I find them, dead or alive, I'll go. I don't really know what happened. I don't. Whether it was premeditated, if they knew I was going to go that way. It happened crossing the border at Nuevo Laredo. They tried to stop me, but I didn't stop. Two streets later, five SUVs trapped me. One pulled up in front of me, blocking my way. A bunch of guys encircled my car. Then I decided to get out as they looked like cops. One of them got into my car and drove off with my daughters. They made me get into another car, and they took us out of the city to a place that looked like a ranch near the road. I could see the headlights of the cars, and there in front of my daughters, they started to beat me up. Then, when I was there, by speaking to them and living with them, I realized there were 15 of them, and among them, I can't be sure of it, but of the 15, there were only two who were criminals. The 13 others, they all had police uniforms. There were local cops who looked after me, and others who seemed, from the way they spoke, to be regional cops. And the others were feds. They all looked like cops working for two people who introduced themselves as members of an organized crime cartel that in Mexico they call Los Zetas. They introduced themselves as such, and the others as cops. They introduced themselves as cops. While they were insulting me, they said, you're alive, you were lucky, but don't come after us. We've got your address, your name, and we know where your family lives. They did all of that in order to demand a ransom. To be honest, I don't really want to say. I lost some of my business. I had to sell several properties. But the exact figure, I don't really want to say.
I decided to sell up everything over there for two reasons. Because I was afraid of working in Mexico, and I was afraid of living in Mexico. I had been threatened, kidnapped. I thought it would be better to leave the country. I sold my trucks, sold my stuff, and I moved here. When these folks move to the U.S., they come and they, they um, buy homes, they buy cars. Uh, a lot of times they'll put their kids in uh, private schools. And so they come to the United States and I think they, they have a significant impact on, uh, on the local economy. And I think that really translates to a significant impact to the national economy, clearly. For the state of Texas, for instance, we didn't suffer as much in the downturn of the economy as other states did. Uh, and, and partially that's maybe as a result of the, of the influence with the, the folks who, who came from Mexico and set up businesses and bought homes. Some clients obviously have invested a tremendous amount of money here in the United States and they've built, um, you know, uh, for instance, there's some clients who invest in real estate and they set up uh, and they build neighborhoods. I mean, they build literally hundreds of homes. Um, they may not be uh, uh, homes that have a high dollar value, but they'll be, you know, a large development. We've had other clients come in and they've bought already existing businesses that were, you know, literally millions of dollars worth to go ahead and buy. This home that we're driving up to on the corner here, uh, we sold to a Mexican family a number of years ago. And if that home came on the market today, it'd probably be in excess of $20 million. This home just recently sold for uh, over $14 million. Well, it really started in 2006 and 2007. Uh, but really, since about 2009 and 10, we've seen more more people from Mexico coming into Houston. Huh? Now, this is another one of the streets that's very popular for for for, for people from Mexico. Relocating another office in the Woodlands, we're looking for space right now, and and to cater to the to, to the Mexico business. Huh? We have several families that, uh, that are sales associates of our company that are from, uh, one from Mexico City and, and two from, uh, from Monterey, Mexico. So we're very, very focused on helping nice people that are moving to Houston from Mexico. Texas is a place of refuge for Mexican capital and is home to the second largest Hispanic community in the USA with 10 million Latinos. It is also attracting investment from the organized crime bosses. I've been in this business about 30 years. It's the last five or six years. We are seeing Mexican traffickers either leave Mexico buy houses, buy businesses, buy ranches, shopping malls here in the United States. They want to get their families out. Kidnappings have gone up. The, uh, the, the traffickers killing each other off, uh, fighting over the turf wars. So they're also afraid for them and their families. So they are trying to leave and establish uh, their uh, residences here in the United States in the Woodland area here in Houston, we're seeing uh, individuals come in and pay top dollar for real estate, whether it be a home, 
or whether it be a business, there's no negotiation. They pay it strictly in cash. It's brought in by uh, armored car and plane. They're trying to get literally tens of millions of dollars out of there into the United States. This strategy is aided by Mexico, which is finally getting it together to fight against money laundering. There's a figure I can give as an example. In 2010, Mexico exported some $20 billion to the U.S. By that I mean cash dollars that entered the Mexican banking system and which were then transferred by local banks into financial institutions in the U.S. These $20 billion cannot be explained with Mexican commercial operations alone. So we took the decision to prohibit cash deposits in the Mexican financial system. And with that single act of prohibiting dollar cash deposits in Mexican banks, Dollar exports, which were worth $20 billion, fell to $8 billion. And what that did was push money back into the United States for investment here and also overseas. So they would bring the money in or have the money deposited through a Casa de Cambio in Mexico. That money is deposited and then is brought through the banking system and then sent back out to a third location that's outside of the United States. But we've seen an, a, a ginormous upsurge in U.S. dollars trying to be repatriated within the U.S. system. In an economy that is 28% cash, the traffickers have an easy time. Thanks to the anti-money laundering legislation voted in 2013 by the Peña Nieto government, foreign investments, and particularly those in the U.S., will no doubt benefit. The anti-money laundering legislation imposes very significant restrictions on the purchase of luxury goods, houses, planes and cars in cash. It also forces a certain number of professionals and business people who are completely legal, yet very exposed, to report all transactions in cash. Houston is becoming one of the main hubs in the United States. Houston is a very large city, and we're so close to the border. That is the key. Well, the cartels in Mexico are fighting over turf areas, plazas. They call them the plazas in Mexico. And a plaza is a certain crossing of a border location. The traffickers will control this certain areas and they will tax other traffickers to use that area to cross their dope. If you're gonna use my area, I'm gonna charge you 20% of your load, 30% of your load, uh, even as much as 50% of their loads. The main thing they, they need to do is cross their, their narcotics. Uh, be cocaine, marijuana, heroin, methamphetamine from Mexico to the U.S. side. Crossing the border, once they get across the border, they are, perf they are pretty much uh, free to move their dope throughout the United States. A lot of different gangs operate here, and we're, we're finding out that the, these traditional gangs or work with Mexican cartels. You know, these gangs will, will work with them, uh, smuggling it in here, storing it here. With annual revenue of six to seven billion dollars, the drugs market robs Mexican GDP by 1.5 percent. In 2006, the conservative presidential candidate Felipe Calderón campaigned on security. As soon as he got elected, he declared war on the cartels. For the first time, a government has declared open war on the ever more horrific tactics of the narco business.
The Calderon government has declared war on the Mexican drug traffickers. And it was only after that that a quick study was carried out to find out how powerful they were, how much money and what weapons they had, and to what extent they have infiltrated our security services. So we have declared a war against a practically unknown enemy which has cost Mexican society very dearly. Given the lack of resources and technical capabilities to fight crime, his strategy seems to have triggered other phenomena. One of these is the diversification on the part of crime bosses. And in some regions, the networks have expanded following their repression. Everyone knows the figure of the 70,000 dead, and practically nobody talks about those who have gone missing, even though there are more than 20,000 missing persons. As for those who have been displaced, we still haven't evaluated the impact of this. There are 40 to 50,000 people who have been displaced. These are extremely negative phenomena. I think there is one statistic that says it all, two maybe. Firstly, current life expectancy in Mexico has gone down for the first time in 60 years. And the other figure that I think is absolutely dreadful is that the main cause of death for people aged 20 to 25 is homicide. The strategy is still the same. That is to say, we are favoring investment in the security services. Public spending has gone up by 14% in real terms over the last few years. That represents 1.3% of GDP. Yet we are seeing very few results. In 2012, the return to power of the Institutional Revolutionary Party, which had emerged from the revolution and was suspected of ensuring social peace by turning a blind eye to the historic cartel of Guadalajara, indicated continuity, favoring a tough approach in the face of an enemy fragmented by the drugs war and ever more hardline. Los Zetas was founded by the Cartel del Golfo when they had hired soldiers, some of them from the Army's Special Forces. These were deserters who had elite corps training. So when these men got involved in organized crime, they brought with them their skills in terms of the deployment of weapons, guerrilla warfare, counterinsurgency, etc., and shared all this knowledge, all these elite court techniques, with the drug lords. As a result, the organized crime killers became far more professional. The violence is being exploited for communication purposes. Mantas claiming killings in the name of the defense of the territory and videos posted on the web showing the glorified terror of the new generation of drug dealers. So, Los Zetas increased the use of violence and the level of professionalism of this violence for all the organized crime gangs. That's one of the changes in quality brought about by Los Zetas. Subele cuatro a la loma. 
¿Con qué lo agarro? Yo? La lona se le den bien las letras, nomás a... La mano, la mano, el compañero, la mano. ¿Cuántos faltan? Ninety percent of the guns that are successfully traced come from the United States. So that, that should give you some ideas of how big the market is. Uh, you know, more guns are recovered and successfully traced in Mexico coming from the state of Texas than any other state in the country. In 2004, the Bush government lifted the moratorium on assault weapons. With 6,000 arms sellers and its weekly gun shows, Texas is a self-service arsenal. Under President Calderon, we managed to seize over 150,000 weapons. That's the equivalent to the arsenal of a Central American army. That gives you an idea of the firepower these gentlemen have, right? So we seized 150,000 guns and a little over half, some 60%, were high calibers, AK-47s and AR-15s. You know, the money that these organizations are, are getting from the sale of their drugs, you could probably say are being used to purchase the guns. What money and what profit they derive from the sale of those drugs that they haven't spent on firearms, they're shipping that back with the guns back to Mexico. You have to understand the drugs come north. The drug trafficking organizations bring the drugs north. They use the same routes to take the guns and the money back south. The bulk part has been changing. We have people that are not doing duffel bags of money anymore. Uh, they have sophisticated vehicles that they push a button, the vehicle comes apart, and then they have special compartments that they put the money in, and they only may move a half million dollars at a time to 300,000. Smaller amounts when they're going south. Weapons, we need to pass, pass laws in the United States that prohibit the sales, or, or not only prohibit the sales, but track the sales of weapons. I know a lot of that falls under the Second Amendment. So maybe not prohibit 100%, but maybe track the sales. Who sells, who purchases weapons, what amounts, and what they do with those weapons afterwards. Uh, a lot of straw purchasers, they purchase weapons in ridiculous amounts and then resell them to drug traffickers. We need to make those people responsible for what those individuals do with those weapons. Uh, stronger weapons, stronger laws for weapons, I think need to be passed. In 1994, in response to the European fortress of the Maastricht Treaty, the ELENA Free Exchange Accord between the USA and Mexico opened the border. With some 6,000 trucks passing through each day, Laredo, the first port of entry into Latin America and the first U.S. inland port of entry, became a focus for the ambitions of the main cartels. were to seize millions of dollars from uh, involving car lots, involving uh, them smuggling narcotics through the car lots, using covered loads, legitimate covered loads, on tractors going up north. Tractors full of um, legitimate merchandise going to Chicago, going to New York, and within it being, being smuggling drugs. Laredo is very important because of the uh, logistics that it provides uh, for the cartels. Uh, cartels such as, as the Gulf Cartels, the Setas or Sinaloa, fight over this area because of the highway uh, IH-35, which is part of the uh, gateway to the Americas. Now there's a kind of a free flow of things like cell phone minutes, um, metal companies that would import steel or um, gold or silver. 
and then even right down to agriculture where the narco traffickers will say, hey, I have cattle. We're also talking about a movement of money back and forth and then they can hide their money a little bit better. Um, with a free flow of capital becomes the free flow of money. So that's what, that makes it easier for the narco traffickers to move it and money launder it. Veracruz, the country's biggest port in terms of financial transactions. It is a driver for the national economy and a location of strategic importance on the drug routes to the US and Europe. Six years ago, when the federal government and President Calderon launched an open war against organized crime in an attempt to stop drug trafficking, the cartels had to diversify. They generate, for example, a set of maybe 60 percent, 50 to 60 percent of the income they generate is going to be through narcotics. The other 40 or 50% that's left is going to be through extortions, it's going to be through kidnappings, stealing. Los Zetas were the first to diversify. They'd arrive in a city, call in the local criminal bosses, local gangs, and would say, now you are Zetas, and you work for us. If you steal cars, 50% of the thefts are for us, but we'll open up new markets for you. It created a kind of national federation of local crime. Five years ago, there wasn't all this crime. The roads weren't so dangerous. There's always been some, but not so much. You have to do whatever they say, otherwise you're in trouble. You don't have the time to realize that you're stuck. The whole truck. They attacked me and a co-worker. They held us all day until... How can I put it? Until they'd emptied the trucks. And after, they left us both locked up. He was with his 11-year-old son, and we were locked up, all three of us, in the cab until the evening. Abandoned. They picked us up in the morning. They sold all the merchandise, all of it. They emptied the trucks, and then they abandoned us with the trucks. We were there, locked in the cab, my co-worker, his son, and me. Organized crime groups would steal tractor trailer loads of, of, of rolls of fabric that were going to a factory to make products for for clothing that would then be exported, and they would steal those shipments, and because of the timeliness of that sh of that sh of that material of that cargo, they would hold it ransom from the owners. The owners had to get that material in order to to get their products uh, completed and sold. Uh, they have their finger on anything that makes money, and this was something that was making money. Again, there is no overhead. You're stealing it. It's 100% overhead right off the get go. There was a thing with a truck driver near our village. 20 days, a month, a month and a half went by, and then they found him. But he was dead. They found him after a good long time. In pieces, right? In pieces, right? Yeah, in pieces. He was found in plastic bags. Wild animals had started to eat him. They found him under a bridge beneath the freeway. They took the truck, stole the goods, and he disappeared. So they'll send groups of, of, of uh, professional thieves, they'll come up here and steal the loads. 
sometimes with the help of people from the warehouses that tell them made this particular trailer, it's got this particular merchandise, high-end uh, equipment, uh, electronics, you know, uh, computers, TVs. And they'll steal them, and then they'll flood the market with it, the blood market. And you'll see them being sold half the price. And it affects everybody because eventually the stores, in order to recoup the price, they'll raise the price in the stores, just like the cartels. The cartels lose a load, the next load dollars raise the price to make their money. It's a Fortune 500. We have a structural problem with organized crime in terms of gas. We register an annual loss of over $4 billion. The gas and oil wells are attacked, drilled into, and the resources extracted to sell on the black market. This year, in 2013, the number of illegal siphonings has doubled compared to last year. The losses are up to 2.7 billion barrels a year. The product is already refined. All they need to do is steal it in order to sell it. And they're operating more and more with legal gas stations. They deliver it, sell it, and the cash is laundered perfectly clean. That gives this trade a major advantage over drug trafficking. Moreover, the transport is free. There are no costs apart from the tanker trucks, which is easy to cover up. Transporting five or ten tons of cocaine or heroin across the country is a whole other business, one that's much more difficult and which presents a much greater risk. Los Zetas recently managed to conquer this market by controlling the gangs that have been stealing gas for years. They managed to take control of them and corner part of this market. In 2004 and 2005, under President Fox's government, I asked a group of very close collaborators to carry out an investigation parallel to that of the security service of Petroleos Mexicanos. And we discovered that illegal operations had been taking place within the company, operations that the security team of Petroleos Mexicanos didn't report. They were taking the product in different ways, sometimes directly from Petróleos Mexicanos facilities, from the facilities themselves. Other times, it was from the pipe network. Petróleos Mexicanos has over 50,000 kilometers of gas and oil pipes. The investigation was very incisive. We can confirm that employees of Petróleos Mexicanos were involved in the theft of hydrocarbons, of gas, because, curiously, they never steal crude. It's always gas or diesel. We have the proof to show that certain regional authorities, in this case the Veracruz government, were involved. Because in that state, there was a network of gas stations that was distributing this illegally obtained gas. In algunas gasolineras in the state of Veracruz, 
In some gas stations in the state of Veracruz, certain groups of people, taxi drivers' organizations, farmers and workers' organizations with close ties to the right-wing PRI party, to spell it out, these groups could fill up their vehicles, taxis or fleet cars, for free if they used a specific gas pump. So they were getting perks in exchange for votes. I filed this report, and when it was received, certain pages were removed from the public domain and classified as secret documents for 20 years. Obviously, the fact that some of the people assigned to securing Petróleos Mexicanos facilities come from backgrounds in the Mexican army is, without doubt, in my opinion, the reason why it was decided not to pursue the investigation. In fact, the current strategy is barely different to that of previous governments. A strategy of continuity, encouraged by the Omerta. Explosions disappearances, kidnappings, executions, and crimes, for the most part kept secret for fear of reprisals. Five thirty a.m., a pipeline explodes after being siphoned. The high street is transformed into a river of fire. As a result, 30 people are dead, 52 are injured, and 84 left homeless. Three years later, the commune accuses Pemex of having covered up the facts. According to Pemex officials and government officials at that time, they were losing up to 50% of the condensate that they were producing. That's about equivalent to $500,000 a day, which if you break that up into you know, months, you're, we're talking about maybe $15 million a month, anywhere between $150 million and $170 million a year. The thefts were occurring daily. The, the thefts of the petroleum products were then smuggled from Mexico into the U.S. They were declared to Customs and Border Protection, the customs uh, officers, as something different. So basically they were, coming, they were able to get that product into this country and then ultimately sell that to uh, individuals that were involved in the uh, petrochemical industry. We identified as many as 40 different individuals and companies. Now, there were le legitimate companies that were involved either in the importation, the transportation, the refining, uh, the sale of the uh, of petro uh, petrochemical byproducts. At the beginning, they, they were allowing it for other people to move it. When they saw that it was very profitable, they, you know, they went into the business and they themselves started moving this. It was 100% profit or moneymaker for the organizations. The, the theft that took place in Mexico basically uh, involved everywhere from uh, armed robbery, where they were stealing the actual trailers and tankers from Pemex drivers who were carrying the condensate. They were driving to uh, refueling stations and stealing the condensate from these re refueling stations and re reclamation stations. There was three Mexican companies that were being used as transport companies for the legitimate shipments, as well as shipments that we had identified as being uh, composed of stolen condensate. And the, uh, the uh, government or the Pemex had contracts, legitimate contracts for these three companies to operate. The entry documents that were being utilized to bring the product in, entry documents that were used to move the shipments uh, within the interior of Mexico or within the area of uh, Tamaulipas, to the port of entry. Once at the port of entry, they were, they were contracting a U.S. broker to uh, provide them with entry documents to the U.S., which were legitimate. 
The smuggling of the condensate was actually occurring through the ports of entry at the far port of entry and at the Los Indios port of entry. Subsequent to that, the merchandise or the product was taken to the uh, port of Brownsville, where it was uh, transferred from the uh, Mexican carrier trucks into large holding uh, facilities. From there, it was usually uh, transshipped to a barge or transshipped into uh, domestic tractor trailers for movement into the, into the interior of the United States or Texas. If you think about it, they don't have any overhead. They don't spend any money to grow this, to refine it, to extract it from the ground. It is a profitable venture. So it would be hard to believe that it is not continuing. If there hadn't been so much corruption and such collusion with organized crime, Mexico would not be facing a situation like this. We have the means and the resources to combat organized crime. But where there are so many people implicated, it's very difficult to keep it quiet. The situation with the hydrocarbons is perfectly clear. The eighth biggest producer in the world, this deep water drilling giant provides 38% of the state budget. With its semi-privatization in 2013, Mexico is seeking to move its economy away from oil dependency. There probably have been cases of corruption in the past in this state-owned company. And it seems to me that when it's a monopoly, one leads to the other. So in order for Pemex to be more transparent, stronger, and to allow it to develop better, it needs to be opened up to competition. The worst corruption takes place where there's a monopoly. Here you have the great hole in the Mexican justice system. Of 100 crimes committed in the country, it is estimated that only two are ever punished, perhaps three. Not one single parliamentarian, not one single Mexican high-ranking functionary has been jailed for drugs. You can count them on the fingers of one hand, one, maybe two. But everybody knows the reality is very different. Impunity is the key to the power of the cartels, a strategy inspired by deregulation and exported across national boundaries. Where is the money gone from the gas stolen in Mexico and sold in the U.S.? I don't think the thieves that delivered it to Houston, San Antonio, or God knows where, have brought it back and deposited it in a Mexican bank, unless it was at HSBC. Then maybe they did. But usually they deposit it in an American bank. It has been proved that American banks handled money from Mexican drug dealers for years, and they received derisory punishments for it. It's an excellent business to be in, being a banker for a Mexican Mexican drug trafficker, and the American banking system profits from most of the money. Everyone knows it. It's an open secret. Anyone who doesn't know it, I don't know what planet they're living on. 